Welcome, or Willkommen. Thank you for joining me to study in depth the 12 Fantasias for Flute Without Bass by Georg Philipp Telemann. This collection of flute music is a brilliant window into the style of composition used in the music of the early 18th century. These short pieces were intended for flutists of all performing levels to enjoy on their instrument. Now in the 21st century, oboists, bassoonists, double bass players, saxophonists, trombonists, and tubists have all been performing these fantasias and calling them their own. Here are some key words for all performers to remember when beginning these works. Elegance, grace, gesture, and poise. I find these works to be formative teaching tools for tone, articulation, tempo through dance styles, ornamentation, phrasing, and musical form. For me, these tools are developed through understanding the function of the implied bass line, recognizing the hidden melodies, and employing convincing timbral changes. Telemann was sensitive to the qualities, good or otherwise, of each instrument of his day. He used the capabilities of these instruments with mastery. The fantasias show clearly the elements of musicianship that all instrumentalists must learn. Since the 18th century, the quote, rules, unquote, of playing early music continue to evolve. Research by early music scholars is ongoing and their study and constant attention to uncovering more details about this era in music will continue to inform and inspire us. I hope to bring some thoughtful lessons to your study of these wonderful pieces based on the research I and others have done. Please bear in mind that this is a genre of music so beloved yet contentious at the same time. Whether you prefer this music played on wooden flutes or metal flutes matters not. We all must realize that the ultimate goal of playing this early music is the same, to educate, be inspired, and be open to learning more and more about this music as time passes. These fantasias for flute are played on more instruments than just the flute, and this serves as my inspiration. They have stood the test of time, and will always serve as fuel for our imagination. Georg Philipp Telemann was regarded in his lifetime as Germany's most famous composer. In a 40-year period between 1720 and 1760, Telemann created a future for music in both composition and publishing. He promoted the art of instrumental and operatic performance that set the standard for the next generation of composers and performers. Being the ever inquisitive traveler led him to experience the world of music beyond Germany. He was born in 1681, and by age 12, he had produced an opera called Sigismundus. Later in his youth, his time spent at the university in Leipzig was with the study of law but he was soon to gain notoriety as a composer in both sacred and secular mediums. In 1702, at the age of 21, Telemann founded the Collegium Musicum in Leipzig. University students performed for weekly concerts at Zimmermann's Coffee House, featuring performances of concerti and small chamber works. Telemann's fame would later rival that of his colleagues Johann Sebastian Bach and George Frederick Handel. Telemann met Handel when he was 20 and Handel was 16. The two exchanged letters and musical ideas and maintained a lifelong friendship. J.S. Bach took over the series at Zimmermann's Coffee House in the late 1720s as Telemann had moved on to promote professional concerts farther away from Leipzig. He took positions as music director in Darmstadt and in Poland. He took advantage of the rising interest in public subscription concerts throughout Germany, and this was a major contribution to his gain in popularity. He visited France for eight months and received great acclaim for his works. He provided the public with new and exciting music in the forms of opera, 
oratorio, cantatas, passions, serenades, leader, suites, concerti, and works for keyboard and small ensemble. Telemann also gained fame because he made his music accessible to the public through self-publishing. He published his music for amateurs and seasoned musicians alike so that all could perform his music effectively. He often took part in engraving the plates for printing his own music and the Fantasias are thought to be among his first engraved works. Telemann was a self-taught musician and was capable of playing the flute, violin, viola da gamba, oboe, trombone, double bass, organ, and harpsichord. His ambition compelled him to write three autobiographies and his business acumen propelled him to publish a musical newspaper called The Faithful Music Master. In this subscription newspaper, which was sent to private households, he would include his own works, but often only in part, so that the practicing instrumentalist would become intrigued and want to later purchase the entire part. He also gave instructions on transposing his works in different keys and gave two clefts, for example, one for the flute and then one for the violin or recorder. Telemann was a seasoned horticulturist. He had a collection of rare plants and flowers, including tulips, hyacinths, buttercups, and anemones. When he had difficulties in his somewhat scandalous private life, he found more delight in plants than people. It is noted that his colleague Handel often sent him exotic plants from England. Telemann frequently visited J.S. Bach at his home, and the two men were good friends. His relationship with Bach was so strong that in 1714, Telemann traveled from Frankfurt to Weimar to be present at the christening of Bach's second son. This was Telemann's new godson and namesake, Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach. C.P.E. Bach eventually succeeded Telemann as music director in Hamburg upon his death. Georg Philipp Telemann passed away in 1767 at the age of 86. The label or moniker Baroque style might not be the best words to describe these fantasias. The classification I would choose is Rococo style. The term Baroque was only recently coined to describe a style of art and architecture in the 1600s and early 1700s. In what we call the Baroque era, heavily ornamented, dramatic and grand gestures of music, dance, painting and literature all became popular. This style originated in Italy and spread throughout Europe. In music, this elaboration meant the abandonment of the strict vocal counterpoint and the balance, order, and equilibrium of Renaissance composers like Palestrina. The composers in the early 1700s used contrasting blocks of sound. Compositions were based on harmony rather than polyphony. Unregulated dissonance was used for dramatic effect. With the development of tonal harmony and metrical time came the development of instrumental and vocal virtuosity. As time passed, the 1730s saw the emergence of what art historians consider the Rococo style. This is the time when the 12 Fantasias were written. Think of Rococo as a later stage of the Baroque era. In architecture, painting, and music, Light, frivolous, and playful decorations with sweeping curves and abstract ornaments were being favored over the majesty and gravity of the Baroque expression. This is an important artistic change that allows us to consider the style in which we should play the music of Telemann's time. Telemann, in his Twelve Fantasias, wrote an unaccompanied line built up from a progression of motives that is full of the same kind of complex curves and decorative figuration. This is quite different from the song-like melodies of the classical and romantic periods. Nevertheless, these intricate lines and figurations 
overlay a clearly discernible melodic framework, implying bass lines with complex harmonic patterns. The style gallant character, which was an element he often used in his writing, was a simple melodic line with the accompanimental line playing a secondary role. Following the fashion of the time, he used many of the popular dance styles of the day. He also used folk music as a great inspiration for many of the Fantasias. To learn to play music that is over 250 years old, we must turn to the writings of earlier times. See your learning as coming from the perspective of an investigative reporter and learn through study and reading books. Don't simply rely on the internet for your sources. This will make your performance more informed and inspired. Read the important books such as On Playing the Flute by court composer and Berlin flute virtuoso Johann Joachim Quantz. I call him J.J. Quantz. He was a colleague of Telemann's and in 1752 he wrote this particular book, one of the most important books for flute, on the scholarship of musical style and aesthetics. He was quite an opinionated character and incited many quarrels between musicians in his day. I particularly enjoy taking this book with me on trips where I am not sure of how long I will have to wait for my appointment. I try to read small parts of it so I don't become overwhelmed at the scope of this massive treatise. Nevertheless, I can tell you that reading this book over time has been a great investment in my musical training. Aside from giving us his scholarly viewpoints in manners of playing adagios, allegros, dance music, and the essential graces and how to employ them, Quantz can be very amusing to us in this day and age. He advises us of rubbing our finger in the powder from our wigs to absorb moisture on the chin if we were to perspire. And he has the fortitude to tell us to simply leave the stage if we are not serious about performing. I think the latter still stands true. If you can, listen to the music of Purcell, Monteverdi, Handel, Bach, Lully, Pachelbel, and other works by Telemann to immerse your ears in the musical style. Learn from the performances of Italian and French opera and understand about the influence of King Louis XIV. The speed and the pulse in music has drastically changed over the last 250 years. Tempo markings have gotten faster over time and the words indicated in modern tempo markings are not the same as from the Baroque period. To start with, the fundamental indicator for tempo is the time signature itself. It is important to realize that there is a different understanding of tempo words between then and now. The larger the number on the bottom, the faster the beat, and as the lower number gets smaller, the beat gets slower. Thus, 416 is faster than 48, 48 is faster than 44, 44 is faster than 42, and 42 is faster than 41. The tempo indications are modifiers. Among the examples, Allegro is happy, vivace is lively, largo is broad, and grave is heavy or weighty. Also, there are some changes between then and now in relative speeds implied by the words. Generally, in Telemann's time, the tempo words in order from fastest to slowest are as follows. Presto, allegro, vivace, note that it is slower than allegro. Andante, largo, not subdivided, grave, still not subdivided, and adagio. This is the only one that is subdivided. You will also notice the subtle chromaticism in the music of this time. There is some reason to believe that 18th century musicians would have thought of a chromatic pair as being not two different notes, but two different inflections of the same pitch. Chromaticism was associated with specific expressive situations, usually associated with grief 
or suffering. Partly, it was a matter of tuning. Equal temperament was rejected as bland and unexpressive. Therefore, in the unequal tuning systems of the time, chromatic motion sounded not smooth as it does to us now, but emotionally difficult and anguished. Moreover, the forked fingerings on all woodwind instruments of the time made chromatic motion sound uneven, each note owning a different color and intensity. This was viewed by composers as an expressive resource to be used sparingly and not as an inadequacy in the technique. Telemann was adept at changing his musical styles, often within one movement from French to Italian. His impressions of French and Italian music are clear in his compositions. In his 1729 autobiography, Telemann writes, quote, What I have accomplished with respect to musical style is well known. First came the Polish style, followed by the French church, chamber, and operatic styles, and finally the Italian style, which currently occupies me more than the others do, end quote. For the majority of the 17th century, composers left ornamentation up to the performer. This was most often practiced in slow movements. When performing the fantasias, you will want to experiment with ornamentation when you repeat the sections. Telemann composes with two styles of ornamentation, French and Italian. Using the French ornamentation, the performer should employ what Telemann calls essential ornaments. The French agréments are essentially the decoration of a specific note. Those little notes such as appoggiatoras, trills, turns, and mordants are considered essential. The Italian style of ornamentation is the decoration of an interval, the musical space between two or more pitches. In more florid Italian ornamentation, the performer should play impromptu variants on the simple ornaments. In other words, improvised ornaments. These are ornaments that are not written down by the composer, but do utilize some implicit rules, thereby given the name of extempore or arbitrary. In slow movements with ornaments or moving notes, think about the Baroque dance as the inspiration of this music in a slow Baroque dance, when the dancer would move from step to step, they would quickly flutter their feet or quickly circle one foot with another. Such intricacy is important to remember when adding ornaments or motion in slow movements. Quick notes must be elegant and never labored. These principles of ornamentation, as stated in Quance's book and the virtuoso flute player by Johann George Tromlitz, will come naturally over time. I suggest using Telemann's methodical sonatas, the canonic sonatas for two flutes, the six concerti for flute, violin, and basso continuo, the Paris quartets, and Telemann's flute concerti as a complement to these fantasias. Study what Quantz and Tromlitz write about playing with good taste. I urge you to study all these works completely. The 12 Fantasias for Transverse Flute Without Bass are the first Fantasias of four sets that Telemann wrote in his lifetime. Some have disputed the authenticity that he wrote these Fantasias for flute, but subsequent research has led us to believe that he is indeed the author. Listed as written in the years between 1731 and 1733, the self-published original edition of the Twelve Fantasias is a bit unclear and of poor quality. In the original edition, each Fantasia appeared complete on one page. Telemann's next set of 36 Fantasias came that same year of 1733 for harpsichord. The 12 violin fantasias were written in 1735, followed by the 12 viola da gamba fantasias in 1736. When the term fantasia was first used around 1550, 
and until at least 1680, it meant a strictly contrapuntal piece, like a Richarcar or fugue. The element of fantasy came from the fact that the composer was not bound by a text, as in a motet or madrigal. Instead, the composer had only their own fancy or fantasy to rely on for generating themes and subjects. The Fantasias by Telemann are not formless. They are all mainly in three or four movements. All the movements represent well-established genres. Preludium, Toccata, Fugue, Sarabande, Bore, just to name a few. The Fantasias were played on the transverse flute, or flauto traverso, popular in the 1700s. It is a wooden flute with only one key. The most important distinction from the boom system flute are, one, the bore tapers rather than being cylindrical, which gives it a tone color with less harmonic development, and two, it naturally plays a scale of D major, and all other pitches require the use of forked fingerings. This results in a more covered tone quality on these pitches. The farther the key signature gets from two sharps, the more veiled and mysterious the piece will sound. The most common material used for making these flutes in the 17th and 18th centuries was boxwood. The one key, the D sharp key, could be made out of brass or silver. Ivory, ebony, and other hardwoods were used on more elaborate and expensive flutes. Each note had a special sound or timbre on the one keyed flute, and Telemann used this to full advantage in his choice of key signatures. Quantz chose Telemann's flute fantasias in 1758 as test pieces for a competition. Telemann was celebrated for writing music that could be presented at higher and lower levels of skill. The Fantasias grew in popularity with flutists in order to show proficiency on the instrument. Emulating the way a Baroque flutist articulates on their flute can be challenging on a modern flute. However, one useful way to consider articulation of this genre is alternating strong and weak tonguing, as Quantz suggests in his book. I use the syllables to and do. Dance was very popular in this period of time, and you will find the inclusion of many dances as the inspiration for the final movements of each fantasia. From Telemann's travels, there are influences and elements of Polish, French, and Italian styles of music, and they appear throughout the Fantasias in different combinations. I will address these influences in each study guide. The question of repeats is integrally linked to the harmonic structure of binary or two-part movements. In the first half, the key migrates from the tonic to a contrasting key, either the dominant or the relative major. Taking this repeat emphasizes this harmonic structure. Repeating the second half is desirable, but not so crucial to defining the harmonic structure. It has become common in the recent past to repeat only the first half and not the second as a compromise, a practice that has become known in some early music circles as the Amsterdam repetition. I would suggest performing each fantasia without big breaks in between each movement. Take enough time to gather your thoughts and be mindful of the tempo and character of the next movement. In this way, you can give a cohesive performance, one in which the listener can understand that this is one fantasia with several different movements. You will see the interesting sequence of key tonalities if you look at the order of the fantasias. Their order of A major, A minor, B minor, B flat major, C major, D minor, D major, E minor, E major, F sharp minor, G major, and G minor seem to be instructional in nature. They do not, however, need to be learned or performed in any particular order. 
Another important earlier body of work that Telemann composed in 1728 was the 12 methodical sonatas for flute or violin. These sonatas follow the keys of C major, C minor, D major, D minor, E major, E minor, G major, G minor, A major, A minor, B minor, and B flat major. Their significance to instrumental pedagogy, most assuredly flute pedagogy, is very important. Telemann names them as methodical to be used as a tutorial for ornamentation in slower, more cantabile movements. The slower movements of these sonatas contain two lines, the top containing the simple melody and the lower line containing the same melody with his added ornamentation. This helps the player decide which style of ornamentation to use. I learned the fantasias, the canonic flute duets, and the methodical sonatas early in my musical training. As a result, I feel I was able to perform the music of other composers such as Bach, Handel, C.P.E. Bach, Leclerc, Quantz, with more attention to the Baroque and Rococo style. In this DVD, we will uncover this effervescent style. These fantasias are so rewarding to share in our performing and teaching lives. I hope non-flutists continue to garner the advantageous lessons to be learned from them. The fantasias are a deep resource of musical teachings for all musicians. They serve as inspiration for many different instrumentalists. Their longevity is a true gift.